very thankful to be here with you all. And uh, I'm very excited because I really enjoy coming to areas that we would call dark, um, simply meaning that there's not any or much light. You know, there are several things the Bible calls light, but there's three things that I would highlight that the Bible calls light. If you go to Psalms uh, 119.105, the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you go to Proverbs 6 and verse 23, it says, For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. And then, of course, if you go to John chapter 9 and verse 5, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So when I think about light, I think about God's word, I think about God's law, which the revelation of perfect obedience to the two was manifested in the life of Jesus Christ, Amen. who is the light of the world. Amen. And so when I say a dark place, I'm talking about a place that knows nothing about God's word. They don't know anything about God's law, and they don't know anything about the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Whenever there's an area that does not have those three things, then we know for sure that is a dark place. You understand that? All right, so I enjoy coming to the dark places because God has raised us up to be light bearers. Amen. Is that all right? That's what we're called to be, family. We're called to be light bearers. And therefore, we need to make sure that we are about our Father's business in bearing light to those who need it most. And so I'm going to show you something today that is very dear to my heart. Uh, you know, I have subjects that I study that are my favorite. I've never tried to be what I call a present truth specialist. Uh, you know, you got specialists out there. If you think of the medical world, you have specialists. Some are specialists in cardiology. Others are specialists in neurology. Some are specialists with the skin, dermatology, etc. cetera. And, uh, you know, that's fine. We need that. But when it comes to the Word of God, I don't believe God wants us to be specialists, per se. I believe Jesus was not a specialist. He didn't focus just on one thing. He knew how to minister to the family. He knew how to minister to youth. He knew how to minister to adults. He knew how to minister to men. He knew how to minister to women. He knew how to minister to the spiritual. He knew how to minister to the mental. He knew how to minister to the physical. Jesus was very diverse. And he was able to meet the needs of the people. In like manner, I believe God wants us to be diverse. He doesn't want us to just be a specialist and just have focus only in one area. And I'm not here to knock anybody that, you know, is a specialist or something like that. Maybe you have a focus. Maybe you love country living, and that's all you talk about. Maybe some people love prophecy. That's all you talk about. But I believe that there's a way that I can tie in prophecy and country living and the family and revival and reformation. I mean, you can tie it all together and give a very powerful message. And I pleaded with God over these several years that he's called me into ministry. I said, Lord, please, let me not be a specialist. I just want to be just like Jesus. I want to know how to meet the needs of the people in whatever area and sphere of life that there is a need. And thus far, thank the Lord, he's accomplished a few things, and I'm grateful for it. And I'm looking forward to greater and larger things. And so as we prepare our hearts to go through our study today, I'm just going to ask us if we can first pause for a word of prayer. And I love to do it on my knees. And if you're able to, I'd like to invite you to please kneel with me. And let's go before the Lord and let us talk one with another with him and let him speak to our hearts. Our loving Father, we are very grateful for the blessing to come together and to study your words of truth. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to hear from heaven while we remain silent and also to speak to you while you're silent and you're listening to us. This is called communion. And Father, I'm grateful for it. I thank you for the little bit we had this morning, and it was sweet. And I just pray that you will speak to our hearts even more right now and enable my mind to give faithful counsel and instruction to your people as we seek to be light bearers for thee. Please forgive us, we pray, of our sins. And grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit, who's the only effectual teacher of truth. Is our prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, 
it's so simple. You know, go to the, I want you to go to the book of John, and I want you to consider the 17th chapter. John chapter 17. And I just want you to watch what the Bible says here. John, we're looking at the 17th chapter, and I just want you to watch what the Bible says as we consider some thoughts from the lips of Jesus when he was giving that most powerful and exemplary intercessory prayer as he was preparing to go to the cross and eventually to the sanctuary to intercess on our behalf. The Bible says in John, we're looking at the 17th chapter, and when you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in John, the 17th chapter, we're going to kind of go right there in the middle of the prayer, and we're going to look at verse 18. And it was in John 17 and verse 18 that as Jesus was intercessing, that he made a very strong statement. He said, as thou has sent me into the world, even so, in like manner, have I also sent them into the world. Now, who is Jesus talking about when he says them? Who is Jesus talking about? He was talking about his disciples. Was he talking about his disciples present in that verse, or was he talking about disciples present and future? Present and future? I believe he was talking about the disciples present, not future yet. Why? Verse 21. When you get to verse 21, I'm sorry, verse 20, it says, neither pray I for these alone. In other words, he's saying, I'm not just praying for a certain group alone, but then he broadens it and he says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. I believe verse 21 is where he includes the rest of us. You understand that? So Jesus was praying for the disciples present because he knew the crisis they were getting ready to come up upon. But then he also kept in mind in his prayer for all the disciples' future, which would be you and I, which would believe their testimony because we're reading Matthew's account. We're reading Mark's account. We're reading Luke's account. We're reading John's account. We're reading James' account, Peter's account, Paul's account. John's account. You understand? We're reading their statements of their interactions with Jesus under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And all of us who believe based on this faithful testimony, Jesus says, I'm praying for you too. Isn't it nice to know that Jesus is still praying for us? I think it's a beautiful thing to know that Christ is on our side. Sometimes it feels like this world is against us. Sometimes when you stand for truth strong enough, sometimes the church will be against you. But I'm grateful that as long as we're doing things in the way that God has called us to do it, we will never have to guess, is Jesus for me or against me? Jesus has already said, I'm praying for you. And as you get stronger and as you gain a true conversion experience, go strengthen the brethren. And so it is that when Jesus said this prayer, it's a beautiful prayer, and I love verse 18 because he says, on behalf of not just disciples present, but disciples' future, he says, the same way that the Father sent me into the world, even so, in like manner, have I also sent you. We don't have to wonder how to do ministry. Do you understand that? We don't have to guess how to do ministry. God has made it crystal clear absolutely plain to us how to get that work done. And he says, you don't have to look any further than Jesus. I believe one of the reasons we have so much confusion in our camp is because we're not doing the work of Christ. Yeah. It's like we're doing every, everything else but his work. And so I believe with all of my heart, I'm convinced that if we look carefully at Jesus, we will understand what needs to get done right here in this area. All we got to do is look at him. And the reason why it is imperative that we look at him is because when you take your eyes off of the light, as we talked about, you can become, you, you end up becoming derailed, distracted, focusing on the darkness. Now, I don't read anything in the Bible that Jesus spent a lot of time focusing on the darkness, on the errors and the weaknesses of others. Jesus was clear the ministers had problems. The people had problems. And what Jesus wanted to do was not spend too much time 
focusing on everybody's problem because the truth is the truth. Listen, this is a true statement for evil as well as for good. What I'm about to share with you is a truthful statement for evil as well as for good. Here's the statement. By beholding, you become changed. That is true for the devil and it is true for God. If you spend your time focusing on the evil, the errors, the mistakes, the shortcomings of others, you will fall into that same boat. But if we spend time praying, intercessing, pleading, being gentle, and learning when it's time to be stern, to do it in the way exactly how Jesus did it, and to always seek to unite the heart back to God, you won't fall. We all have choices. I've met many negative Seventh-day Adventists. And that stuff wears on you after a while. I mean, all the time. We just talk about and rehearse our problems. I mean, I have a class that I'm teaching uh, my family right now. We're all, we're, we're, we're having a little wilderness experience. It's a blessing. And uh, last week, we were going through the class and we were talking about principles and devotion. I realized God's people don't even know how to have devotion in the morning. We do all sorts of stuff, but we don't know how to have inspired, step-by-step -step devotion the way God prescribed it, so you get the best benefits. So I said, I'm not going to let that happen to my family. So, you know, I reminded everybody. I said, okay, we learned this a long time ago. Let's go over it again. And I'm with my children. My house is filled with teenagers. My oldest son is 19. My daughter, Kayla, last week just turned 18. Caleb is 15. In September, he'll be 16. Jada, I'm sorry, Caleb is 16, and in September, he'll be 17. Jada is 15. In, no in November, she'll be 16. So, I mean, literally, we just got a house filled with teenagers. And you know how it is. The world wants teenagers. The devil wants teenagers. The devil's having massive success right now through young people. So it's up to father and mother to do all we can to create those right barriers. So we started going through devotion. And when we go through devotion and look at all these principles, it was like we were studying the Word of God and just saying, this is what God wanted when you have devotion. You see, devotion in the morning, when you meet with Jesus, the goal is that your heart and my heart is more devoted to him. After my morning communion with God, I should be more in love with him. Some of us are not having anything like that in the morning. Sometimes we get up in the morning and we're just doing readings, if we're even doing that. And we wonder, man, why is my heart still so cold? Why is it that I'm still frustrated in the gospel, etc.? Listen, I've been married to my wife for 20 years, and I thank the Lord that, I, man, I, I mean, I got like a living love for that woman. I mean, I'm sitting, I'm, it's just, I marvel at how much I love her. And I really think to myself, Lord, thank you so much for the gift that you have given to me through my bride. 20 years. I look back past those 20 years, not one act of adultery, praise the Lord. And I thought about it. I said, what is it that kept me from committing adultery? on my wife. It wasn't lack of opportunity because I learned a long time ago, even the women in the church are not all saints. And that's why I'm, I'm very careful. If women want to counsel with me, I'm like, okay, I'll bring my wife with me. Amen. If we talk, can we go in that room? No, we cannot. We're not going in any private areas. You understand it? You got to keep your guards up. Man. Listen, there are serpents in the church. Make no mistake about that. The last temptation the devil took down Israel with was with the Moabite whorish women. So, you know, I always tell ministers, y'all better be careful the way you interact with women. I don't believe it was because of lack of opportunity. If I wanted to be a foolish, careless minister, I'm sure that a door could have been open, that I could have fallen into adultery if I wanted to. So the question is then, what really kept you, Dwayne? And it's Four incredibly simple letters, L-O-V-E. Love has so much power, it will keep you from sinning. Amen. To commit adultery is a sin. You understand that? But God's love is so powerful that even in when we're bent and inclined to sin, if we come in contact 
with that divine, sweet, unadulterated, pure love. If we come in contact with Jesus, my brothers and sisters, there's so much power in the love of Christ that it will kill the player in any man. It'll kill the sinner in any man or any woman. Always remember, how can I have victory over sin? The answer, love makes it easy. Don't forget that. The more you love Jesus, the harder it will be for you to break his heart and sin against him. Why is it so easy for us to sin against him? Because we love our sins more than we love Jesus. Is that simple enough? Praise be to God, he can change that. But it comes through real devotion, real communion, getting to know him as it is our privilege to know him. Now, did you know that that's an inspired statement I just said? Getting to know him as it is our privilege to know him? Let me read the whole quote to you. It's in Desire of Ages, page 668. And it says in Desire of Ages, page 668, it says, When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, it says our lives will be a life of continual obedience. Isn't that what you want? That's what all of us want, don't you? Don't you hate that roller coaster relationship we have with Jesus? One minute obedient, next minute disobedient. One minute obedient, next minute disobedient. It's a roller coaster. I gave up amusement parks a long time ago. How about you? But yet, that's that one ride we just can't seem to give up. But Jesus says there's a way to crush that ride. He says it's more love. My favorite hymn More love to thee, O Christ. Y'all know that one? Let's sing it. More love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Hear now the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea, more love, O Christ, to thee. More love to thee, more love to thee. That's the key to victory over sin. And God wants to give it to all of us. But we must come in contact with his mind. And the more we come in contact with his mind, and by beholding that mind, we become changed and receive that mind, we will be more like Jesus and then we can work more like Jesus. As I told you yesterday, Gospel Workers, page 204, it says, a man has greater influence by what he is than what he says. And this is what God wants for all of us. So I believe if we behold Jesus long enough, we'll know how to finish this work. We'll know how to do this work. But the first thing is, is that we must be like him. And that's why Friday night, that's why Sabbath morning Sabbath school, that's why 11 o'clock hour, we talked a lot about us. We talked about our hearts. We talked about our true condition. Because once we can get that dealt with and really walk in the light and the power of his justification by faith, which leads to sanctification and glorification, it won't be a problem to finish the work. And so yesterday I showed you that God's people were on fire. That Philadelphian age, they did a great work. But it didn't finish it. We're still here. And now God wants to work through us, the weakest generation on planet Earth. And this is the generation he wants to light up the earth with his glory. Amen. It's going to be a powerful, mighty demonstration. You and I got the privilege to be part of that number by his grace. And so the church, unfortunately, though receiving all these blessed endowments from heaven, the church, unfortunately, fell into a very serious trap by the devil. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy, and we're going to look at chapter 3 as all these beautiful, precious truths, present truths that I'm sharing with you right now, the reality is, is that another truth is that the Apostle Paul saw prophetically the condition of the very church that God left all of these lessons and teachings and blessings 
this same body of people, to a very large degree, was going to miss the message. And he says it in a most profound way in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to consider verses 1 to 4. We'll pause at 4, and then we'll continue thereafter. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, if you're there, please say amen. amen. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1, it says, This know also, that in the last days, what kind of times? Perilous, Perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, uh, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And sometimes when we read that, we'll say, oh boy, that sounds just like Portland. We say, oh man, that sounds like New York City. That sounds just like Los Angeles. That sounds like, and we name the city, we name the place. And the truth of the matter is, is, yes, those things are taking place, but what makes it worse here is not so much that the Apostle Paul is just highlighting the sins that are going to be prevalent throughout our world in the last days, but he says in verse 5, it says what? Having a form of godliness. Now, does Los Angeles have a form of godliness? Is there anything in Los Angeles that you see that represents God? Is there anything in Portland that you see that represents God? Is there anything you see in New York City that represents God? No, my brothers and sisters. The world is sinful and they're bold about it. They put their sins on billboards now. They put their sins in music form and put it on speakers in front of stores and blast it. The world is sinful and they're exceptionally bold about it. No undercover. This is not leave it to beaver ages. This is not the I Love Lucy ages, when the husband and wife used to sleep in separate beds. You ever watch those programs, black and white? The husband and wife would sleep in separate I mean, that's when television was a lot cleaner. They, they thought it was immoral to let the husband and wife be seen lying together in bed. So when you did, if you, literally, if you look back to the Leave it to Beaver days, the, the I Love Lucy days, I mean, they slept in separate beds. That's how much television was attempting to keep things clean. It's amazing how television has changed. And God's people are still watching it. Confusing. God's people, not just the world, God's people are still watching it. We watch adultery all the time, men having intimate connection with women that's not their wives while they're married to somebody else. Somebody literally put a post on Facebook, is it wrong for a man to, 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 to kiss a woman that's not his wife in acting? And that's why I'm getting off of Facebook, because Facebook, you, you want to get in on some of these conversations. I get tempted. And I'm like, man, I should just go in on that. But I don't have time for that. There's much more important things to be doing. But sometimes I see these statements, and I'm just like, why are we even having this discussion? Are you kidding me? It's like if a man and woman was walking down the street, and another guy comes up to that man's wife and says, can I kiss you? And then just walks up and starts kissing her. And let's say the wife starts kissing him back. And they start kissing each other, touching each other, feeling each other, squeezing each other and all that stuff. My question is this. Would that man not feel like my wife just cheated on me? Would he not have that whole sense and that whole feeling? Honey, how, you just violated our covenant. Is not the man going to feel that way? Absolutely. Who ever said that adultery was just penetration? Jesus said in Matthew 5, if a man looks at a woman lustfully, he's already committed adultery. So where did you and I get this idea that adultery is penetration? It's deeper than that. Don't tell me. If a man could look at a woman lustfully and, and heaven says adultery, certainly if a man and woman start intimately kissing each other, feeling, hugging, what is in the world is that? I know what it is, adultery. Now my thing is this. I guarantee you, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett, they could walk together. Now, if they're just walking on the beach together and some brother rolls up to Mr. Smith and says, hey, man, step aside, let me kiss your bride, and just goes ahead and starts kissing her, Will Smith is probably going to be ready to knuckle up with that guy. He's going to be like, brother, what you doing? And he's going to do what he can to get that man away from his wife. That's my wife. But isn't it amazing how a paycheck can change everything? 
Once Jada says, hey, Will, uh, I got an opportunity to play a part in a film. And it's not like the beach where there was no paycheck involved. It was just a man who just wanted to kiss me. This one, I'll be kissing some super handsome guy, whatever, but we'll, 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 we'll increase our income by $20 million. And all of a sudden, Mr. Smith says, well, honey, blessings on you. Go ahead and get that done. You see how confusing the world is? And this is the foolishness we watch. We watch adultery. We watch this stuff. And we wonder, why can't I have that, that vital connection with Jesus? We wonder why. There's no confusion, brothers and sisters. We're playing with the devil. And the devil plays for keeps. That's the part we're not understanding. When you're ready to let go, he's going to say, where are you going? You're not going anywhere. And some of us, like the demoniac, we can't even open our mouths and cry out for Jesus anymore because we're so stuck in sin. But thank God that the Bible and the spirit of prophecy lets us know God says, I'm not like man, I look at the heart. And when Jesus came to that demoniac in the Gadarenes in Luke 8, Jesus came to him, and though he couldn't even speak, the devil took over his tongue, but the devil did not take over his heart fully. And Jesus was able to read his heart and heard that little cry. It was a little cry. But it was enough to get the attention of Jesus, and Jesus made that man free. Amen. That brother loved Jesus so much that he said, Lord, please let me travel with you. I'll go anywhere with you, Lord. Jesus says, nope, stay back and tell everybody what I did for you. He got no training. But a whole village was ready to hear about Jesus when he came back to Gadara. Isn't that powerful? Amen. My brothers and sisters, Jesus says, a time's going to come when the people that I endowed all the blessings of heaven, they're going to forget their heritage. And they're going to be comfortable with a form. And that's not what God wanted for us. We should not be comfortable with just a form of godliness. I do not believe for a minute that 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 was talking about the world merely. I believe Paul was emphasizing the church, the condition of God's people. The light was starting to lose its light. That's what makes the times perilous. And so a lot of our religion has been dumbed down to a form. Look good. On the outside, just like Pharisees, listen, we have to understand, Pharisees looked great. Pharisees were very excellent-looking people because they were sticklers for the law. If they saw a gnat in the water, they'd be like, well, we can't drink that water. That water's unclean. But they were so backwards that they didn't understand it. These brothers meet, and one day Jesus heals a man who's been sick for 38 years. And when Jesus heals the man who's been sick for 38 years, he did it by chance on the Sabbath day. So this brother's walking with his mat, of which they said, you can't do that. You can't walk around with your mat. That's working. So they see him walking with a mat, and then they, you know, they go to Jesus. They go to him. What are you doing? The man, Jesus, who, the man who healed me said to take up my mat and start walking. So he starts walking. And these guys, in their, in their zeal for God, in their love for God, said, this man can't be blessed of God because he broke the Sabbath because he did what to a man? He healed him. So you know what they did on the Sabbath? They came together and they said, hey, let's plot to kill a man on the Sabbath. And they actually thought that that was okay. You see how Pharisaism can blind a man? You can think it's okay to plan to kill on the Sabbath, but not think it was okay to heal on the Sabbath. That is completely backwards. That's what happens when the pharisaical mind takes possession of a human. We will make very unrighteous judgment. God says, this is what happened to my people. They dumbed down to a form. They're just happy that they show up every Sabbath. Everybody says, hi. We all say happy Sabbath, even though we're not happy. You know, we go through church services, give the appropriate amens when it's necessary. 
eat a bunch of food that we know we don't eat sometimes when we're home, plant-based. And we kind of just keep doing that day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. God says, I want more from you. God says, I need more from you. You got to come up higher. We all got to come up higher. And so what we need to understand is the reason we need to come up higher is because forms of godliness equals no power. That's what the verse said. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. When we're stuck in a form of godliness, we have no power. God needs to get us out of this. It's a bad condition. Right now, the world loves power. I used to do martial arts. I used to do martial arts for many years. I studied three disciplines, Taekwondo, Shotokan, and what's called the dancing martial art, Capoeira, Brazilian. And when I used to do these forms of martial arts, I was determined to be the best. I mean, I, I, was, I was already going to tournaments, beating people up, and they beat me up, and I was going down that route. I was, gonna, I was determined to be an incredible martial artist. Today, if you look, and, I, and, I, and God pulled me out of that. I'm not an advocate for martial arts today. I do not believe that this is something God's people should be delving into. It really creates a spirit of self-uplifting, self-confidence, and also a whole world of mysticism. And so I'm not an advocate of martial arts today. Nevertheless, the world is. Today, the world wants to see power. And that's why they love watching mixed martial art programs and all those things. Because in their mind, when somebody could walk into that cage, and when they're small, and when the biggest people in the world come up against them, almost like a reenactment of David and Goliath. I think about the Gracie family. Hoist Gracie and all those guys, they came into those little cages. They, those guys weren't even buffed up muscular or anything. But they had some ways that they could grapple an individual that will pin you down to the ground. And they began to beat the biggest, most muscular, fat, didn't matter what size the person was, they would hold them all down and beat them. And next thing you know, Gracie schools started to open up all around the world. All around the world. Why? Because the people said, that's power. I want that power. The world actually wants power. Did you know that? I need you to hear what I'm saying. Because I'm trying to help you understand why the church that sometimes can fill up up to 500, 800, 1,000 people only have 100 or have 120. There's a reason for that. But why is it that when Beyonce, Jay-Z, when they, when they want to hold a concert, Justin Bieber, when they want to hold a concert, all they got to do is they just step on stage, and when the lights come on and they just sing one note, all of a sudden people just, ah, and they start fainting. People just start passing out. That person just sings one note, and it's like that note just reverberates all throughout the whole entire crowd of thousands of people. You know why? Because in their minds, that's power. That's power. That's why you got a whole bunch of young brothers that want to become a bunch of rappers. That's why you got a whole bunch of young sisters that want to become the next neo solo R&B artist. That's why you got a whole bunch of young brothers and young sisters that want to be the next pop artist. Because in their minds, they see power. The world wants power. Now, you know Romans 1 and verse 16, right? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. But the problem is, is that God's people fell into a form and they have no power. So people are like, why should I come to the church when you're going to tell me have self-control and you have no self-control? Why should I come to a church and you're going to tell me about holiness, but there's nothing going on about holiness with you? Why are you going to tell me to come to a church and you're just as naked as I am on the streets? Why are you going to tell me to come to a church? Literally, th this is the mindset of the people that we're called to witness to. They're looking at us. Go to Romans chapter 2. Look at what the Bible says. Romans chapter 2. Paul had to get on a group who was judging another group. And when Paul was getting on this group, he got to a point that he began to ask a question. And I want you to watch the question in Romans chapter 2. Watch this. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 2, this is why I'm telling you, it is more important of what we are than what we say. 
A man has greater influence by what he is than by what he says. It says in Romans chapter 2, watch it right here, Romans 2, and you can go ahead and go right down to verse 21. And watch how Paul reasons with so-called teachers. He says, thou therefore which teachest another, he asks the question, what's the question? Teachest not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal. What's the question? Do you steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery. What's the question? Do you commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Paul is literally saying, if you're preaching a message, you want to make sure you're living your message. And this is why, again, I would have done you a disservice if I would have just come up in here, hey, let's talk about how we're going to win Portland. Let's do all sorts of techniques and gimmicks and stuff so we can get everybody to come in and be just as perhaps unconverted as we are. That's not what God wants. God wants us to search our own hearts, our own condition, and then we can go ahead and do a greater work. So a form of godliness, no power. Is that clear? Now watch this. This is why, family, you ever heard of those terms? You see, when we think of revival and reformation, it, it is not that we are called to try to uh, have an in-reach focus. The revival and reformation is needed that we might successfully do our outreach focus. You understand that? So depending on how people address revival and reformation, you might get different messages. But the truth is, God wants us to have a revival and a reformation for the purpose of fulfilling our mission. You understand that? If we don't have the proper revival reformation, we will not successfully do our mission and we're going to mess things up. God doesn't want us to mess things up because you can find a lot of places where they're doing things in a messed up way. That's not hard. What's hard to find is a place where we're doing it the right way. That's the hard part. We dare to do something hard because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen? Amen. Now watch this. So when you think about this, you know this quote, don't you? A revival among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. Have you ever read that before? Do you believe that? Did you ever preach that, teach that, or share that with anybody else? Well, I want to let you know that I think you you taught something wrong. (laughs) Because there are two words that I deliberately took out of that quote. Does anybody know what the two words are? Very good. Here's the two words. A revival of true what? Godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. To seek this, true godliness, should be our first work. You understand that? So this should be our first work. If this is our first work, we can do all the other works in their proper order. You understand that? So what God wants from us is to focus on true godliness. Why? Because we fell into a form of godliness. Doesn't that make sense? That actually makes sense. God wants us to seek true godliness that we might successfully fulfill our mission. And this should be our first work. There are many things that falls under the category of true godliness. But I'm going to show you something that is often not connected. I carefully listen to some sermons ever so often, and I've heard a lot of the revival sermons. I've heard people say, we got to come back to the Bible. Is that true? we got to come back. I've heard people say, we got to come back to the spirit of prophecy. Is that true? Yes, I heard that too. I heard people say, we got to come back to true, heartfelt, earnest prayer. Is that true? Absolutely. I've heard all of that. But there's something a lot of times we miss when we talk about true godliness, and God wants us to make it plain. This is the reason why I'm here. So I want you to watch this. If we want to understand true godliness, we need to go to 1 Timothy 3.16. So let's go there. 1 Timothy, we're looking at chapter 3, and let's consider verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. I want you to watch this now and watch it very carefully. 1 Timothy chapter 3 
and we're considering verse 16. And I want you to watch what the Bible says, because if our first work should be to seek true godliness, then obviously we need to understand some things about godliness. So let's go ahead and look at 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. And if you're there, please say amen. amen. All right, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of what? Godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Amen. Amen. Now, who is this talking about? Jesus. This is talking about Jesus. No question about it. This is talking about Jesus. You can connect John 1, 14 to that. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God was manifest in the flesh. You can connect Matthew 1 and verse 23. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which, in, which being interpreted is God with us. So God was manifest in the flesh. So we know that this is talking about Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to know godliness, you don't have to look any further than Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, it said something that was foundational to everything else. It says God was manifest in the flesh. Okay? God was manifest in the flesh. And as a result of that, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached amongst, etc., etc. So, God was manifest in the flesh. Let's consider what the book of uh, Philippians chapter 2. It says, who being, let, let's go to Philippians 2, because I think the slide doesn't have it because it's chopped up some of my slides there. So let's go to Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians, the second chapter, we're going to consider what God manifest in the flesh is really teaching. Because we need true godliness. So we're going to look at godliness, God manifest in the flesh. We're going to look at that so we can understand some lessons about what does this mean to me practically. So now we're looking at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians, the second chapter, the Bible says, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but verse 7 says, he made himself of what? No reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Now, we have to understand, the demonstration of godliness is found in Jesus. When we read about God being manifested in the flesh in Philippians 2, it tells us God was manifest in the flesh for sure. But then it tells us more. It says he made himself of no reputation. So when we go about demonstrating godliness, are we doing it for the purpose of making a reputation? No. That's a big difference between the way we deal with miracles and all these other things versus the miracle workers that we see today. They do a lot of their work so they can make of themselves a reputation. Jesus, when he came on this earth, he said, I'm not going to make of myself. Now, did he have a reputation? Yes, he did. He was equal with the Father. He's God. So he humbled himself. You understand that? So that means for us practically that whatever work you and I do, we are to do it in lowliness of spirit. Amen? Is that a practical lesson? lowliness of spirit, whatever it is. That's why I'm telling you, you got to be careful with your talents. You got to be careful with your skills. You got to be careful with your abilities. Whatever God has blessed you with, do your work quietly and humbly. Not looking for accolades, not looking for reward, not looking for prestige, not looking for somebody to put us out in the front and say, look at how great this person is. Don't feel disrespected. That's why I, that's why I love the Seventh-day Adventist church. Because when somebody sings, what are we supposed to do? Amen. We're supposed to say amen. You know why? Because a song is typically a prayer. Amen. You know what the word amen means? So let it be done. So when they sing, all to Jesus I surrender, when they sing that, we should be able, when they're done, no matter how beautifully they sung it, we should be able at the end of that song not to go, <laughs> because that's going to help build up reputation. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say, amen. In other words, we're in agreement, Lord, with that song. So let that be done in my heart, 
in my home. There's a philosophy behind why we play music and do music and sing the way that we do. Part of it is to help us maintain lowliness of mind. Don't make of yourself a reputation. So we know that that's for sure. But then after that, what else did it say? It said uh, in lowly, it said uh, he made of himself no reputation. And then in verse 7, he took upon him the form of a servant. He was a servant, a servant of servants. So what else is demonstrated in godliness? Godliness is not just simply being humble for humble's sake. Godliness is being humble or humbly serving other people. You are saved to serve. Please don't forget that, family. Evangelism is not something the preacher should have to beg you to do. It's your job. The, we, we joined the... Remember yesterday I told you about the way a person comes to Christ is the way they'll walk in Christ? I'm telling you, that was a very deep point. The way we come to God is the way we'll walk in God. Many of us are in the church and we act like God owes us something. Not understanding we owe him everything. We are called to serve. This is not something that we should be debating on or begging about or you waiting for some minister to show up to tell you that. You were brought into the faith that you might serve. And all you should be praying about, Lord, show me where my place is in your plan. That should be our, like our gigantic number one prayer. Lord, show me where my place is in your plan. I know I have a place. Remember Education 267? Remember I read that to you? I told you the specific place God has appointed us in this life will be determined by our capabilities. The most important thing you should know right now is what are your capabilities? By your capabilities, you will learn better the specific place that God has for you in ministry. You don't have to guess. You don't have to guess. It's there. So we know for sure that a demonstration of godliness, it deals with a state of mind, which is to be humble, faithful children of God, but it also deals with activity, which is to be faithful, humble servants of God. Is that right? Amen. Amen. Now watch this. Because of this, it's not enough to just look at who Jesus is, but look at also how he served. First, we should be like Christ, but then we should serve like Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes sense. Because all of that is how we see a demonstration of godliness. Now watch this. This gets sweet. So I started looking at Jesus, right? Do you love looking at him? Amen. This is the one man I love looking at. Did you catch that? And I'm still 100%. You understand that? I think Jesus is so incredibly attractive. Every time I watch him, I just say, Lord, that I might be like you. Help me to stop being like me and be more like you. And here it is that when we look at Christ, look at what it says. The Bible says in Luke 4, 18 and 19, right? How about we read this together? It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to what? Preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to do what? Heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. When we look at Christ's servanthood, what do we see combined? Preaching and healing. Is that right? That's what we see combined, preaching and healing. Now notice, remember our, our text early in John 17. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. When Jesus came, he came humble. He came lowly, but he was also a servant. Therefore, we should be humble, lowly, and we should be servants. How do we serve? We should preach and we should heal. Not just preach. Not just teach. Heal. Are you following that? God does not ask you and I how many medical, medical missionaries do you know? God is asking you and, you and I, are you a medical missionary yet? 
All of us are called into the preaching and healing work. All of us. And it's so easy to prove that from the Bible. A thousand times easy to prove it from the spirit of prophecy. My brothers and sisters, God has made this thing clear. Do you want to see a nice proof that all of us are called to do, get, be involved in the healing work? Would you like to see that from the Bible? Somebody says, that doesn't exist. I remember my wife and I were in Singapore, and we were doing the, the health work there, and we were doing it. All these division leaders, everybody came out. I mean, every, everybody came out. <laughs> and it's like, and everybody was there, and I remember we were sharing the word, and I remember the pastor, he was looking at me with curiosity, and he's just looking at me. And I said, okay, you know, I understand. So I'm preaching the word. Bible, 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 Bible. Hardly ever quoted the spirit of prophecy quote. Bible, Bible, Bible. And I noticed the pastor's countenance. The pastor starts, and he's getting all giddy and smiling. So I'm like, I don't understand that, but nevertheless, I'm going to preach anyhow. So I give the message. When the message was over, the pastor came up. He says, I have to tell you the truth. It goes before the congregation. He says, I have to tell you the truth. He said, I thought that Brother Lemon was going to come up here and give us all these Ellen White quotes to say this and to say that, he says, but I did not know, as a pastor, he said, I did not know that these health teachings are in the Bible. He said, I didn't know that. He said, church, we have to do this. This is the scripture. And I said, yep, and that proves that Ellen White was a faithful Bible student, so we need to read more of her writings. You want to see how the Bible can prove to us that God has called all of us to be medical missionaries? All of us to have the healing work? You want to see that from the Bible? It's very simple. Okay, Matthew 28. Let's go there. little exercise. Matthew 28. Watch this. It's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Matthew 28. I must be honest with you, I believe this is how we should study the Bible. I believe whatever point we make from Ellen White's writings, we should be able to substantiate it from the Bible. I believe that. Matthew 28, watch this. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, look at verses 18 and 19. Matthew 28, 18 and 19, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Then he says in verse 19, Go ye therefore and do what? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now watch this. If, have any of you ever looked up the word teach in Greek in verse 19? You ever looked up the original language on that word teach? If you have a different translation of the Bible, who has a different translation from King James? What does your translation say in verse 19 when it says, go ye therefore? Make disciples. Very good. Did you know that the word teach, matateu, what it means is make disciples. So literally, Jesus is talking to disciples, saying, go make more disciples. So before we're all church members, we're actually disciples. I don't read anywhere where the Bible says, go ye therefore and make church members. Because that's how some of us act. We act like members. You know how it is. You ever had a membership at a gym? You glad you got the card, but you never show up. You understand that? It's like, what's the point? You spent your money to join an organization. You got the membership card, but you're not getting the benefit. You understand that? God says, get that membership mentality out of the way. Disciples are people who work. Go ye therefore and make disciples. So everybody who joins the church before we're called to be members, we are first called to be what? Disciples. Now watch this. Acts chapter 10. Just three verses that I'm going to substantiate this point. We can go deeper, but I'll show you just three verses. This was one, two more verses. Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10 now, notice what the Bible says. Acts, we're in chapter 10. Look at verse 38. Just using three verses. And I'm going to show you that God wants all of his disciples very simple. Watch this. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. When you get there, please say amen. Amen. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? The Holy Ghost, and therefore he had what? Power. Power. And it says, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. 
that's a beautiful summarization of the work of Christ, isn't it? Now watch this. That's what Jesus did. Notice, anointed with the Holy Spirit, therefore he had power. He went about doing good, and he was healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Mental, physical, spiritual. And God was with him. Luke 9. Luke 9. I wonder who had the same experience. Luke 9. And I want you to watch the number. Luke 9. How many disciples did Jesus start with? He started with 12. Is that right? Started with 12, 70. Later on, 120, etc. You know, just kept bursting out. I got that. But he started with 12. Now watch this. In Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, notice what the Bible says. Then he called his how many disciples? So notice, all of the disciples. Is that right? It says, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them what? Power and authority over how many? All devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. How many disciples had power to heal sick people? How many of the disciples were actually medical professionals? I just want, I, I'm a thinking man. Eventually Luke comes in, and then we got one physician. Nobody else. But did they have power to cure? To cure? Did they have power to heal diseases? How many of the disciples were anointed with this ability? All of them. So is Ellen White wrong when she says in volume 7 of the Testimonies to the Church, page 62, where she says, we have come to a time where every member of the church should take hold of medical missionary work? Was she being overzealous or was she being biblical? She was being biblical. All disciples were called into the healing work as well as the preaching work and the teaching work. And that's not just for disciples present, because we already said, as you sent me, so I'm sending them. So it's not just for disciples present, it's for all disciples. You understand that? God wants us all to be involved. People can be involved at different degrees. Some will be surgeons, some will be this, and some will be that. But all of us, to some degree or another, are to do the healing work yeah. under the anointing and power of Jesus Christ. Now, a few more slides and we're done. Watch this, because we're talking about the revival. Go to Matthew 9. Let's look at verses 1 to 6. Let's, let's watch Jesus demonstrate godliness. Let's watch him do it. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Let's watch him do it. Matthew 9, 1 through 6. I love these stories. Matthew 9, 1 through 6. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in Matthew 9, 1 through 6, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, and said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Do you know that that was a common statement of Jesus? Be of good cheer. He always would say, be of good cheer, be of good comfort. That's how we are to enter into this work. Amen. That's when, I mean, when I, when I have the privilege of going to someone, Brother Lemon, somebody needs to be anointed, they're sick or whatever, what do they have? They have stage 500 such and such cancer. You know, just something terrible, something that just sounds totally irreversible. We don't go in there, well, sister, brother, um, I don't know. You know, we, we, don't, we don't do that with them. We go there before them. Now, listen, we don't go in there lying. Yeah, that's why I'm telling you, your textbook is going to be Ministry of Healing. We don't go in there lying and, and just saying a bunch of stuff that we don't know ourselves. But what we can do is go in there with the Ministry of Hope. We can go in there letting them know that which is impossible with man is possible with God. Are there people that have had stage, high-level stage cancers and been cured? Are there people like that? Amen. Of course there are. ALS is a disease that's known to have a 100% death rate. There are people with ALS who have been cured. Pancreatic cancer, because of how fast it moves, it's a silent killer, 
it develops and develops and develops inside of us and we're completely asymptomatic. And then eventually you start feeling that upper abdomen pain, start radiating to the back, you know, start all going through all that stuff. And next thing you know, you go get checked out, they do the ultrasound and, oh, you have a tumor on the head or the tail of your pancreas, et cetera. And by the time they find that out, it's often stage four. The problem with pancre pancreatic cancer is it, 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 it wastes you away very quickly. That's what Elder C.D. Brooks had. February he was diagnosed, July he died. And that, it's right according to the books. They say it right there. They say, you have two to four months. Very vicious disease. Do you know there are people today who have pancreatic cancer and did not die? Completely cured? What I'm saying to you is that which is impossible with man is possible with God. And therefore, we can come in as gospel medical missionary evangelists and we can say, be of good cheer. You're under God's will, and whatever God wants is what will be done. And we can say that with confidence. Whatever God wants is what will be done. If God wants to make you a demonstration of his glory and wipe that thing out so that all the doctors will baffle and marvel, he'll do it. He did it with my mother. My mother had eight lesions on her brain. Told the doctor, instead of going a pharmaceutical route, doctor, we would like to go a nutraceutical route. The doctor took his eyes off of me, ignored me, looked at my mother and said, don't waste your time with that stuff. Very rude man. When he did that, I saw my mother put her head down in confusion, and I got in there and gave her my courage. Amen. I gave her my hope. I gave her my strength. I said, Mom, let's go. Amen. We don't need to listen to him anymore. Yeah. Let's go. Because yeah. he wanted to rush her into the chemo and all of that other stuff. And I was like, look, we got time for that. Let, let's go. Mom and I were leaving, and I said, hey, Doc. He looked back at me. I said, I look forward to making you a believer. <laughs> and then we walked out called up Sister Patsy, God's angel, medical missionary that I knew, and I said, Sister Patsy, we need you. Need you to work with my mom, put her on a very rigorous program, and she did. Man, I remember I called my mother four days after she started treatment, 18 days. Normally when I call, hey, mom, hey, Dwayne, how you doing? You all dragged out, down voice. I called four days after treatment, hello? She was like, hello? I was like, mom? She was like, yeah. I said, what happened to you? You sound like incredible. She said, Dwayne, I have so much energy. Amen. She says, I'm eating different than I've ever eaten. I'm done. And she just starts going in. She says, thank you for sending Patsy. She's an angel. <laughs> I said, you're right. She is. <laughs> Called her 10 days later. Hello? Mom again? She, yeah, she, she said, Dwayne, she says, I could use my left arm like I could use my right arm again. Getting all this strength. 16 days later, Dwayne, yes, Mom, you won't believe it. What's up? They did a CT scan, did an MRI. The doctor said, Mrs. Lemon, we can't explain this. <laughs> All eight lesions are gone. I said, Sister Patsy, what'd you do? She said, oh, we did a little tofu poultices. Tofu? Po tofu is food. We scramble tofu. <laughs> she said, we did a tofu poultice. We did some hydro. We followed God's laws of health very faithfully, etc." I mean, it was just an incredible testimony. Amen. What I'm telling you is that God gets the final say. That's all I'm trying to tell you. There are some people with stage four that God does not, in his wisdom and his love, says, I will not raise you back up. And I study the reasons why. I'll talk to you about it if we do our training. I'll talk to you the reason why God sometimes does not raise people up. Because there's some people he doesn't raise up, no matter how hard we pray and fast. But even when he doesn't do that, that's an act of love. We'll see it. What I'm saying to you is that God can do anything. So this brother... He's in a very impossible situation. He's in a very tough situation. But yet Jesus says, be of good cheer, because he had discernment to see that not only do you have physical ailment, but you have a deeper spiritual ailment. That's lesson number one to all medical missionaries. You need to pray for discernment. People are going to come to us with physical need, but they're actually going to have an even deeper spiritual need. 
And so it is that it says, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes within themselves, this man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it's easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say arise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. Question. When we see preach and heal, which one did he do first with this man? Preach, we would call spiritual. Heal, we'll call physical. Let's do it that way. Which one did he do first with this man? He, dressed, he addressed spiritual. But before that man left his sight, he also did what? Physical. So did, was Jesus faithful to his mission? Yes, he kept the two together. Now, if you look at John 5, we're not going to turn there for time's sake. John 5 is the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda, sick 38 years. Jesus goes to him and says, you want to get well? That brother starts going into all his problems. Jesus bypasses that, says, get up, take up your mat, start walking. So what did Jesus address with him first? Physical. But then Jesus sees him in verse 14, and he says, you're well now, go and sin no more. What did he address? Spiritual. So Christ kept the two together. You understand that? Now watch this. Here we go. This is the key point of the points. God says, as you sent me, Father, so I'm sending them. All power has been made available to us. The problem is, somewhere along the lines, God's people lost their focus. Perilous times come because now what's happening in the world is now happening in the church. Men are lovers of their own selves. They're proud, blasphemers, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. As a result of this, their religion has turned into a form and they have no gospel power. God's solution to this last day issue is a revival and reformation for the purpose of coming back to fulfilling our mission. But the revival that's needed is a revival of true godliness because God's people have fallen into a form of godliness. So in our hunt for true godliness, we went to 1 Timothy 3, we saw great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. We said, that's Jesus. We looked a little bit closer at Jesus, and we saw when he was manifest in the flesh, made himself of no reputation and served. So we are called to make of ourselves no reputation and simply serve. So we said, well, Jesus, how did you serve in this demonstration of godliness? He said, I kept together the preaching and the healing work. Sometimes I started spiritual first and I ended physical. Sometimes I started physical first and ended spiritual. But the bottom line is I kept the two together. Jesus now says, go do thou likewise. Because how many disciples were given the ability to heal? All. And so it is today that same power is available to us. That's something to think about. It hurts me when I think about how many people I knew how to give Bible studies to, but I did not know how to show them how to overcome a cold, how to deal with their toothache. You ever tried doing a Bible study with a throbbing toothache? Is that hard or easy? You see what happens? You see, you see, what, you see how, how if, we're, if we're overly spiritual and we have no practical physical, you start not making a lot of sense. I can't tell somebody, man, you got to study these prophecies. And that brother's like, yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, you got to study that prophecy. That brother's like, yeah, 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 I'm trying to go through it. But that brother's in pain. He's like, I need help. I need, like, real help right now. And it's sad because if we just simply knew, you have a toothache? Okay, we're going to take a little piece of gauze, and we're going to get three things. We're going to get cayenne pepper, activated charcoal, and peppermint oil. And we're going to take those three, we're going to mix it together, we're going to stick it on that gauze, and we're going to stick it right up there in your tooth, and I want you to chew on it. Cayenne is heat. Heat draws blood. So if there is some type of infection and poison and so on, it's going to put the heat there, and it's going to draw the blood to that area. 
activated charcoal has the ability to adsorb poisons. So when the blood rushes to that area with all that bacteria and stuff, the activated charcoal can now adsorb those poisons. Peppermint oil provides oxygen. Whenever you're in pain, when oxygen is applied, it helps alleviate the pain from the inflammation. So there's a rationale between the cayenne pepper, the activated charcoal, and the peppermint oil. So when they put that on, it's not like Ambisol, <laughs> where it's just getting rid of your pain, and when the Ambisol wears off, you still got the issue. This is not only alleviating the pain, it's actually helping solve the problem. Is this recipe for every toothache? No, because some toothaches are for other reasons. But this is one example of a thousand. My point is, is that, wow, I love the fact we did a medical missionary training in Texas. Taught a whole bunch of Bible workers and others how to do the medical missionary work. And I remember one guy, he went and he started knocking on doors in his area in Texas, and he started knocking on doors because I was coming back to that church in a few months to do a gospel of health meeting. So he started knocking on doors to solicit Bible studies and everything, got to a door, and the guy's like, Yes, how can I help you? He realizes this man is sick. He's getting ready to tell him, hey, we got an evangelist coming in town. He's going to tell us about health. And he sees this guy is sick. He says, oh, man, you look pretty bad. The guy says, yeah, I got the flu. It's beating me up. He says, Yo, you know what? Are you open-minded to trying things if, if it was just food? Just food? Yeah. Not even herbs, just food. Really? Yeah. What you got? Nature's penicillin. So he said, let me show you how to make that. So he goes ahead, he makes nature's penicillin. It's food. It's literally food. The only thing that's in it that's not necessarily food food is the peppermint oil. But everything else, onions, lemons, grapefruit, you know, oranges, a bunch of citrus stuff. Blends that thing together, gives the guy the nature's penicillin, comes back in two days. That brother opens the door, hey, how you doing? Man, that stuff worked great. He said, it worked great, fantastic. The guy said, man, I'm happy you're feeling better. He said, so again, why were you here? Oh, yeah, this evangelist is coming in town. He's going to do the health meetings. I'll be there. And when I came in, I had the privilege of being there, and that man was there. Amen. Giving their hearts to Jesus. It all started from nature's penicillin, and now you're giving your heart to Jesus. Amen. What I'm telling you is, is that this is a blessing, my brothers and sisters. Now, watch the closing point right here. It's right here. Christ gave a perfect, Representation of what? True godliness. I wonder how he did it. It says, by combining the work of a physician and a minister. Do you see that? By combining the work of a physician and a minister, ministering to the needs of both body and soul, healing physical disease, and then speaking words that brought peace to the troubled heart. Councils on Health, 528. A revival of true godliness, greatest, most urgent of all of our needs. To seek this should be our first work. God wants us to come in contact with Jesus, that, why, that we might partake of his spirit, his character, to become lowly, humble servants. And when we serve, it is not enough to minister just to the spiritual we must also minister to the physical. Again, how shall we reveal Christ? I know of no better way than to take hold of the medical missionary work in connection with the ministry. Amen. Call to medical evangelism, page 41, paragraph 3. Medical ministry, page 319. If you want to really turn Portland upside down, you got to do it God's way. Amen. If you do it God's way, there will be blessings that are incalculable. You won't be able to count it. You'll only figure it all out throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity how much God worked through you to help others. We're suffering. Many of us are sick. Many of us are hurting. God can turn all of that around if he wants to. And I want you to know that God actually wants to and enjoys healing. Amen. 
You know, sometimes when we say, if it's God's will, he'll heal. And sometimes we see less healing and more dying. And so sometimes our minds begin to think, well, I guess God is not really trying to do a lot of healing right now. Well, that's not the case. Sometimes we're just not doing God's program. Maybe we're not trusting him. There's a lot of things that we have to consider. But the more that I read, God wants to heal. He's really in the healing work. This has been an incredible journey. I mean, I remember months, a couple of months after my surgery, and I mean, you feel all sorts of stuff. If you never had open heart surgery, and I pray you never do, but wow. So I called my cardiologist, and, and I, I said, listen, man, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this. What is this? And, da, da, da. and he said, Mr. Lemon, 70 Adventist brother, and uh, one of the most incredible cardiologists, bless his heart. He said, Mr. Lemon, he said, can I explain something to you? I said, yes. He said, when they laid you down, they took a saw out. And when they took that saw, first, you know, they, they cut your skin. But that saw and those knives that they used, they had to cut skin, tissue, bone, nerves, all these different things. And then they touched your actual heart. They said, then they closed you up. So now you have to let skin, tissue, bone, nerves, and the very organ that's been touched, all of that has to heal. And Mr. Lemon, that does not happen overnight. He says, it generally takes one year to go through full healing from a surgery like this. Because I'm complaining after two months. I'm like, look, man, when am I going to feel like normal again? And, you know, I was impatient. And one of the great lessons I learned through this is patience. Patience and trust and cooperation. I fill my body up with greens because if there's one thing, if you, if you have cancer or if you want to avoid cancer, you need to fill your body up with greens. Fruits are good, but greens because a lot of those essential minerals that you're going to need for that healing and so it's going to come from your greens. So that's why you got to eat greens, eat greens. If you have to get a green powder, a nice organic, you know, non-GMO, et cetera, get a good green powder and you make that thing, you load your body up with the greens. It's going to give you that. Three things typically God's people are very short on, iodine, magnesium, and definitely vitamin D. Three. You got to fill your body up with these things. We need it. How much the more if we're going through a healing from a very invasive procedure. My point is very simple. God has done wonderful things. I mean, it's seven months now, and I admit, a lot of the stuff that was annoying me is gone. A lot of it. I remember I was walking with Thomas Jackson, and I scared him. I, did, I just had to do it. You know, I like having fun. I know I look serious when I'm preaching up here and everything, and I mean, I'm, I am serious about God's word, but it doesn't mean that, you know, a brother doesn't know how to play and, 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 and do innocent play. You know, I'm not talking about foolish, giddy play. I'm talking about innocent play. So I'm walking with Brother Jackson and uh, Brad Neely, and we're walking around Meat's property, and we're talking, and I was just like, Dad, I said, how you feeling? I said, you, you, because, you know, he had a heart challenge too. So, you know, I'm like, you, you know, we're partners now. <laughs> you know, we're heart guys. So, you know, we started talking to each other, and I said, hey, I said, can you do a cartwheel? He said, why am I going to do a cartwheel for? You know, he's just giving it back to me. I was like, Dad, come on, let me see you do a cartwheel. No, I'm not going to do a car. I said, I'll do one. He said, Dwayne, don't you do it. And the next thing I, whew, I, just, I just did it. And then he was like, Dwayne! And he's yelling at me, you know, thinking that I'm going to hurt myself. But I didn't hurt myself. God has performed a great level of healing. And he's looking at me laughing, and I'm laughing at him, and we're just rejoicing on how God is restoring our bodies Amen. as a symbol of what he's going to do when the resurrection comes Amen. and the translation day comes, whichever one we experience. And he's going to change all these vile bodies and give us brand new, flawless bodies. My brothers and sisters, there's a great work to be done. Gospel medical missionary evangelism is the work that God has called us to do at such a time as this. Amen. Some of us will do it to greater degrees than others. But all God wants you to do is just play your part faithfully. The key is 
This is the work that God wants to bring back together. This is a divorce that never should have happened between the ministry and the medical missionary work. And I am so glad that God is in the reunion business and he's reuniting these works together. And you and I have the privilege to receive training and instruction that we can know how to do this work in such an efficient manner that we can give him glory. And my question is very simple. How many of us are willing to be a part of this solution that God wants to give in this area? Please let me see by the raise of your hand. And as you're willing, I'm just telling you, God's going to do something special through you. Special, special, special. I can't wait to hear all about it. I love hearing the testimonies. Last point, we went to Bulgaria. And when we went to Bulgaria, we went there to share with some folks on how to do this work. Such lovely people there. And we were there in that church and we're doing the trainings and everything else. And Plumman, that's the gentleman whose house we stayed in, really great man. Brother Plumman and his wife, Lily, we stayed there. And, you know, they, 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 they're just so kind. And, you know, and they, they take nice care of you and so on. And we would train the church. And I remember Sister Lily would just sit there and she would just look with amazement at these remedies and the, the gospel and combining the third angel's message with health reform and, and all these different things. And I remember Sister Lily was just loving the message. And here it is. We finished the training. We all consecrated ourselves before the Lord. And I said, all right, it's time for you to turn Bulgaria upside down. And they understood, yep. Well, then I left. And this is the most rewarding thing you can see as a teacher. We as teachers, I'm telling you right now, we as teachers do not want you to come to us and praise us and tell us this and tell us that about how great, able, and all these other things we are, because that stuff hurts us, like I told you. But this does not hurt us. Sister Lily one day was on Facebook. And when Sister Lily was on Facebook, She put a picture up. There were at least 12 people that were non-Seventh-day Adventists that Sister Lily was doing a cooking class. And she was doing the very recipes that my partner who came with me, Elder Preval, and, and, and they were doing the recipes that Elder taught them. They were doing the natural remedies on the people, and they, you see the people wrapped up in their sheets and you know, going through their hydro treatments and everything else, people who are sick, and they're literally getting well. You see the other people teaching the gospel and sharing in books, and you see the people just happily receiving it. And then you see them getting baptized. Amen. And Sister Lily says, we just want you to know we did not forget what you have shared with us. I said, that will take all day long. Not, hey, you're great. Hey, you're this. Hey, you're that. But to say, hey, praise the Lord. We want you to know your mission to us was not in vain. That does the heart nice. And we were able to praise God together. And they are on their own. We don't need to come back. I told them, I said, I don't want to come back. I said, save your money. Don't spend any more money on bringing all these American preachers in. I said, you learned it now. Now grow in it. Take that money. And go teach others. Go teach others. Put a lot of us out of work. Stop inviting us self-supporting preacher teachers, etc., and all these things to keep coming back a thousand times to tell you the same message a thousand times. Keep that money and do a greater work right there locally. And they're doing it. I'm excited about that. I don't know the next time I'll be in Bulgaria, but I know that by God's grace, I'm going to meet a ton of my Bulgarian brothers and sisters when this earth is made new. Amen. Man, that's exciting. I mean, I'm, I am serious. That's exciting. Amen. That's really exciting to me. That's duplication. That's what we want. Yes. Duplication. And so my hope and prayer is that we can go through some things and uh, we'll take a few minutes to answer some questions and then we'll consider ourselves dismissed. But I just want to pray a prayer of what we'll call commitment, just a prayer of commitment that we will do what it takes to learn what we need to learn so we can do an effective work for the honor and glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is that all right? Let's do it upon our knees, please. Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the wonderful, wonderful example that you have left 
for us through the example of thy son. Thank you so much for what Jesus has taught us. Now, Lord, it's time for us to get to work like never before. But, Lord, we must remember it is more important what we are than what we do. So I pray that as we have the devotion, as we have the communion, as we grow in understanding your will and your way for our lives personally, as we receive Jesus as a personal Savior, not merely the Savior of the world, I pray, dear God, that you might empower us with your spirit like you did with those disciples and show us how to not only preach and teach, but also even to heal. And I thank you, dear God, that though this may seem impossible with man, we're grateful all things are possible with God. Keep us faithful to this end, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.